always a pleasure to have the privilege of studying a little Torah uh, with uh, with all of you uh, this evening. Um, today on the uh, on the Jewish calendar, uh, it was the nineteenth of uh, of Kislev, and I just uh, noticed this ad in one of the local newspapers, so I included it on your uh, on your source sheet so that we could use it as a jumping off point. Uh, it's an ad for uh, a Siyom Hashas and a Hakel concert and a Febrengen. And there are a lot of terms here that um, seem to be known to, uh, to insiders. If you look at the top, so it says it's Rosh Hashanah Lechasidus. It's the Rosh Hashanah of Hasidism. 19th of Kislev, celebrate the Chag HaGeula. So the holiday of uh, of redemption of the 19th of uh, of Kislev. So uh, to the uninitiated, uh, we have to wonder uh, just what it is that uh, we're meant to be celebrating on this day. I don't know, the kids had a regular school day. No one came home talking about uh, the holiday of Yutes Kislev. I guess it depends where you send your kids to school. But uh, the, the kind of uh, provocative question that I wanted to begin with is uh, what is the significance of this uh, of this special day so in the course of our session tonight hopefully we'll answer some of these uh, some of these questions let me just say a word or two uh, by way of introduction over the past uh, number of weeks I've sometimes lamented that there are uh, uh, not any meaningful or not any decent biographies of some of the characters that we talked about. So you can't really find uh, an academic biography of the Shah or the Taz or the Magen Avram. When it comes to our subject tonight, there is in fact an excellent uh, biography. It doesn't focus at all on the halachic contributions of Schneer Zalman of Liadi, uh, but uh, the excellent biography that I'm referring to is the biography written by uh, Emmanuel Etkis, um, it's called Rabbi Schneer Zalman of Liadi, The Origins of Chabad uh, Hasidism, and it's available on Amazon, or it's available in the, uh, in the library. It was written in, uh, in Hebrew originally, uh, but, it's been, uh, but it's been translated. Um, Emmanuel uh, Etkis is uh, one of the greatest living scholars of 18th century Jewish history. I had the personal privilege of studying with him when he was a visiting professor at Yeshiva University a number of uh, years ago. He wrote the biography of the Vilna Gon, he wrote the biography of the Baal Shem Tov, and he wrote this biography of Reb Schneer Zalman of Liadi, the first, the first Lubavitcher Rebbe. So I'd say the first half of tonight's session draws heavily on the scholarship of Professor uh, Edkis. The parts I get right, I attribute to him, and everything else uh, I, can, uh, I can take credit for. Let me add just one final uh, introductory note, and then I want to begin to talk about uh, Rabbi Schneir Zalman and the origins of Hasidism and, uh, and Chabad. So, you know, if you opened up um, a Shulchan Arach and you just started learning some of the, uh, some of the halachos, uh, and someone stopped you and said, oh, but do you know the history of the Magan of Ram and who that was and the history of the, the Taz? And so, you know, sometimes those things, the the biography and the history and historical context really matter. And sometimes, you know, you could be just fine without the historical context. You know, we're trying to figure out if you didn't light, a, you know, if you didn't light candles on the first night of Hanukkah, and now you're lighting candles on the second night of Hanukkah, should you say a shechiyan? So you look up the halacha and you know, does it matter if the person who authored the opinion lived in 16th century Tzvat or 18th century Poland? Maybe, but it's at the end of the day an intellectual argument, and you can understand uh, the different uh, positions, and you look for the best uh, for the best argument. And sometimes, not always, but sometimes you could say, you know, history is nice to know, but it's dispensable. In the case of Schneer Zalman of Liadi, I want to argue that historical context is entirely indispensable. You can't understand the man or his writings or his teachings without understanding who he was, what he was trying to accomplish, what his goals were, what animated him, and what it was he was doing when he wrote the books that he left behind and the texts that we read. Okay, so who was Rup Schneer Zalman of Liadi, sometimes known as the Baal Hatanya, sometimes known as the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, sometimes known as the Shulchan Ar Harav, and that's kind of our 
segue uh, this evening. This has been a course about Rabbi Yosef Karo and the Shulchan Aruch and the commentaries to the Shulchan Aruch. And this man, as we'll learn in a few moments, wrote a book called the Shulchan Aruch uh, Haraf. So who, who was this man and what can we learn about the origins of Chabad and the origins of Hasidus in, uh, in the process? Okay, so this is obviously a big topic and I just want to say a couple words to set the stage and put things in context. As you know, the Baal Shem Tov, is generally considered to be the founder of uh, Hasidism. He's born in or around 1698, and he dies in 1760. So the center of our story is going to be the second half of the, of the 18th century. Hasidism, as you know, uh, taught that God is imminent. Everyone can be close to Hashem. Torah, in the, the study of Torah, is not the only path to, to get close to Hashem. There's, there's an emphasis on tefillah. There's an emphasis on, on simcha. Um, there's a Rebbe who can guide you, and mysticism and reliance on mystical texts uh, are very important in the uh, in the Hasidic world. Okay, so the Baal Shem Tov decided in about 1740 to expound his teachings in the shtetl of Mezhibizh, and uh, he attracts a number of uh, students to uh, to his court. Among the most prominent. Some of these names will be familiar to you. Among the most prominent uh, students are Yaakov Yosef of Polnoy, Meir Margolius of Ostrog, Menachem Mendel of Bar, Dovber of Mezrich, and Arye Leib of Polnoy. So Dovber of Mezrich uh, becomes one of the uh, leaders of the inchoate Hasidic movement in the uh, aftermath of the death of the Baal Shem Tov, in 1760, okay? So we consider that like the second generation of uh, Hasidism. And uh, Rav Schneer Zalman, who's born in 1745 at around the age of 20, becomes interested in Hasidus, in Hasidus, in Hasidism, and uh, uh, travels um, from his uh, birthplace in Liozno, which is in contemporary uh, uh, Belarus. Um, he travels to uh, Mezrich, to the uh, to the base medrash of uh, Rav Dovber. Okay, Dovber, one of the principal students of the uh, of the Baal Shem Tov, and um, and a young uh, Schneir Zalman uh, becomes attracted to the teachings of uh, of Dovber and uh, begins learning uh, Hasidism and Kabbalah with his uh, with his teacher. He studies with him for a number uh, for a number of years. Okay. After the Magid's death. Okay, remember, the Baal Shem Tov died in 1760. The Magid of Mezrich becomes his heir for around the next decade, but he only lives until 1772. Upon his passing, Rav Zalman, Zalman, uh, along with Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk, become essentially the heirs to the Hasidic, uh, the Hasidic movement. Okay, so they are the, the kind of uh, uh, heads of this, of this fledgling movement of, uh, of Hasidism. So, as you know, um, the Vilna Gon led the opposition against, uh, against Hasidism. Um, the Vilna Gon was the uh, undisputed uh, Gadol Hador. He held no official position. Um, he was not the rabbi of a shul. He was not the head of a uh, base medrash. He was not an av Bastin. He was just the Vilna Gon. And everyone knew that he was the greatest uh, rabbinic mind and greatest rabbinic figure of his uh, of his generation. No questions asked. No debate about this uh, about this issue. Okay. He lives just to put things in perspective until 1797. So the Vilna Gon is not happy about uh, about uh, Hasidism. He's in Vilna. He's in you know present day Vilnius, present day Lithuania. And uh, Hasidism is starting to take a take a foothold. He gets wind of what's uh, what's happening. Some of the changes afoot. The Hasidim are doing things in davening that we don't do. Certain movements and gesticulations, and they've changed the nusach of davening, and they do shechita in a in a different way. And they're not careful about the times of davening. And and he wants he wants none of it. And he says this is uh, this is deeply problematic. The back of his mind may be Sabadianism and Frankism and the sense that uh, we cannot abide 
the promotion or the acceptance of a new sectarian movement, we have to nip this in the bud. And he says, no, no Hasidism. Okay, these guys are beyond the pale. We don't accept them. And uh, they have no, they have no business, um, you know, being in our, uh, being in our community. So in 17, uh, in 1772, uh, in 1772, um, Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk and Reb Schneer Zalman of Liadi uh, make a trip. And they decide they're going to visit the Vilna Gaon. They're going to meet with him. And they're going to try to uh, persuade him. They're going to try to persuade him that uh, really Hasidism is not uh, sectarian. It's not so different than, uh, you know, it's traditional and, and you should be on our side. We're all on the same team. We can drink a L'chaim together. Now, just to zoom out for a second, you know, some of the challenges that uh, I've expressed in the course of the past weeks is, you know, how much information do we have about the Shach? You know, I shared, we had like one letter from, from the Shach. And so it's fascinating to read the one letter that survives. It, when it comes to Shner Zalman of Liadi, we have troves and troves of documents, books that he wrote, letters that he wrote, letters that people wrote uh, that wrote to him, reports of people who had come to, to meet with him. And you have to remember, right, he's a Hasidish Rebbe. So if somebody ever got a birthday card from their Hasidish Rebbe, so they, they didn't like, you know, throw it in the trash the, the day after the birthday was over, they put a frame around it and they, and they put it in a, in a lockbox and they told their children all about where the key is to the lockbox. I'm exaggerating here, but just a little to make the point that in the case of a Hasidish Rebbe, because there was this special relationship between the Rebbe and the Hasidim, there was an extra effort to preserve and maintain, you know, anything that had to do with uh, to do with the Rebbe. So we have all kinds of uh, a firsthand and secondhand documentation with respect to Shner Zalman of Liadi. Here is an example: a letter that he wrote with um, his with his uh, uh, reflections. This is like twenty five years after the fact. But he tells the story of how he took a trip to meet the Vilna Gaon. It's unbelievable. And he writes the following. You have it in source number one. He says, <laughs> We went to, to meet the Vilna Gaon. The idea was to, uh, to chat with him, to talk with him, and to try to disabuse him of any false ideas he has about our movement. <laughs> Mendel, this Menachem Mendel of Vitebsk. And what happened? We got to his house, the Sagar Hadeles Ba'adenu Pamayin. We knocked on the door and he closed the door twice. We asked if we could meet with him and he said no. The Chasher Dibru Lo Gdole Ha'ir. Rabbeinu, Hinei Ze Harav, and before Sam Shalahem Balis Vakach im Kvod Toras. Uh, we tried to convince the rabbi of the city. We said we could arrange the meeting and if we could just meet with him. Shalom on Israel, we'll make pizza. And you know what happened? We tried and we tried to get a meeting with him. So you know what the Vilna Gon did? He left town. He left town until we until he heard that we weren't there anymore, and then he went back home. Okay, he just he said, "I'm not I'm not talking to you. You're you're beyond the pale, and I'm not taking the meeting." And and again, this is not an apocryphal story. We have the first hand account from Reb Schneer Zalman himself. Okay, and he only stands to lose by by sharing the fact that the Vilna Gaon was so unwilling uh, to meet with. Him. The aftermath, and this continues in the source if you're interested, he says, as long as we were in the neighborhood, we went to the neighboring town of, uh, of Shklov to set up some kind of uh, a disputation or some kind of public debate where we could answer publicly questions that the Misnagdim, our opponents, had about, about Hasidism. And somehow we had this uh, discussion, we had this debate, it went absolutely nowhere, we accomplished uh, nothing, and we got ridden, and we got ridden out of town. So 
following the uh, uh, following that uh, that debate, the leaders of Shklov, uh went back to the Vilna Gong and said, "You know, you wouldn't meet with this, uh, you know, this Hasidish guy, but we did, and we talked to him, and we confirm what you suspected." And uh, and at that point, um, there was an organized and systemic campaign launched against Hasidism. There's some debate among the scholars whether and to what extent it was launched by the Vilna Gaon, but it was certainly launched with his uh, with his approval, and things uh, continued to escalate uh, uh, from there. I'll just say a note, and Emmanuel Etkis is very careful to uh, uh, to point this out. Um, he said, you know, Schneer Zalman um, was in charge of the Hasidic response to the persecution at the hands of the uh, of the Misnagdim. And his main, uh, his main teaching with respect to how to respond was restraint. He said, you know, they're going to egg you on and just don't take the bait and we don't need to fight with them. We should feel the correctness of our convictions and we should plow along um, believing that, uh, that we're right. And one day our opponents will, uh, will, come, to their, uh, will come to their senses. Emmanuel Etkes actually makes a following, uh, a fascinating um, observation. Um, it's a very important question, I, and I don't know anyone else who asked it. He said, you have to put yourself in the, the mind and the hearts of the Hasidim living at the end of the 18th century. And you wake up every day knowing that the undisputed God al Hadur thinks you are a sectarian. So what do you tell yourself, right? W when you have that thought, you're like... We everyone respects his opinion, and everyone has to live with his position and his and his opinion. We're living in a way that he has deemed contrary to uh, normative Judaism. So, well, what do you tell yourself when when that thought goes through your head? Like it, it, he didn't say it, he didn't mean it. No, he said it, and he meant it. So Emmanuel Edkis, um, uh said. That the, there's a few explanations, a few ways to think about this question, but perhaps the most compelling is that uh, the Hasidim told themselves the Gaon said it, and the Vilna Gaon said it, and the Vilna Gaon meant it, but his position was predicated on false information. So he was misled, and uh, we had no way of ever disabusing him of what misled him, so he reached a conclusion that's actually not right. And if you don't say that, so then you're really in a uh, you're really in a trap because if you believe that the Vilna Gaon is the God of Hadur and he poskins and he poskins against you, so how could you not kind of come back into line? So they had to tell themselves some kind of story about how the Vilna Gaon had been uh, had been misled. Okay. Let me say a couple more words about uh, about Schneer Zalman's um, biography, and then um, we'll pause. For uh, for a moment to ask if there are any uh, any questions or uh, or comments. So throughout this time, the 1770s, 1780s, 1790s, um, Reb Shneur Zalman sets up a, a Hasidic uh, Hasidic court, and he attracts hundreds and then thousands of Hasidim who come to uh, come to his Hasidic court. He has a reputation for being a spellbinding orator and this charismatic uh, speaker. The sermon becomes a very important component of his pedagogy and his uh, and his teaching. And there's another institution which he popularizes, uh, colloquially called uh, Yechidus. You have Yechidus with the Rebbe. What's the Yechidus with the Rebbe? It means that you have a personal audience with the, uh, with the Rebbe, where you can pour out your heart and talk to him, and he'll spend, you know, not two minutes, but he'll spend real time with you to uh, guide you in the ways of mysticism and uh, and Hasidism, and to set you uh, and to set you on the path. And I'll just say a note, which I'll hopefully we'll circle back to uh, later. So he's inundated by these uh, by these uh, Hasidim coming from uh, from, all, from all over to hear his words of Torah and to uh, to learn from him and to seek his uh, seek his guidance. And as a general rule. He always privileges the new chassid and people he's never met before over kind of the local, the local community. And again, I'll circle back to this because he's very interested in the kind of expansion of this, let's just call it an empire, right? The the Hasidic, uh, the Hasidic teachings that he is propagating should uh, spread 
to uh, all the, the regions and all the provinces of the, the Pale of Settlement throughout the Jewish community. And the way to do that is to connect with as many people as possible um, and to connect with people who are coming from, uh, from far away places. In addition, he took a great uh, interest in the dispersed Belarusian Jewish communities throughout the Pale of Settlement. And he had you know, uh, close connections with those, uh, with those communities as, uh, as satellites. Um, again, kind of thinking about how to um, expand the reach of his of his teachings and uh, and the Hasidic uh, and the Hasidic movement. 1797, a conflict broke out between Schneer Zalman and a man called Rav Avraham of uh, of Kalisk. It was kind of a, it was kind of a turf war, and it's not our um, it's not our topic for tonight, but I just want to um, put this, uh, you know, in front of you to let you know that it wasn't all rosy. Um, and again, I'll come back to this in a second. Even internally within the Hasidic community, there were kind of these internecine uh, fights and uh, and disputes over all the kinds of things that one would expect to uh, to to see people fighting about, as far as uh, you know, where funds uh, where funds go and who has the authority, and uh, um, you know those kinds of uh, those kinds of questions. In 1798, this is now the year after the Vilna Gaon has passed away. In 1798, things go south okay, for Reb Shneur um, His enemies, and he has many. His enemies report to uh, the uh, to the czarist government that uh, that he's an enemy of the state, and he is uh, he's arrested, and he's imprisoned in a fortress in a little uh, island right uh, right in or outside uh, Saint Petersburg, and he spends about two months in uh, uh, in prison. We're going to circle back to this. Uh, we're going to circle back to this in a second because his time there and the uh, material that he produced while in prison is actually quite uh, is actually quite important. And as a spoiler alert, the day of his release from prison in 1798 is the 19th of Kislev. Okay. And that is the anniversary that uh, all Chabad Hasidim celebrate today, the Yom HaGi'ulah, the day on which the first Lubavitcher Rebbe was released, was redeemed from his imprisonment at the hands of his enemies in 1798. In 1801, Rabbi Schneer Zalman is arrested and imprisoned again, this time following a denunciation by a man called Rav Avigdor ben Chaim, who probably out of other uh, uh, reasons to, uh, or other uh, valid accusations, came up with the notion that, uh, in fact, Schneer Zalman was a, a Sabadian, a follower of the false messiah, uh, Shabtai, uh, Shabtai Tzvi. About a month later, he was released uh, from uh, uh, from prison, but he stayed in St. Petersburg for some uh, period of uh, of time. Just to uh, round uh, to round things out during the Napoleonic Wars, Schneer Zalman actually supported the Russian Empire, and in the words of uh, of Emmanuel Etkis, he feared that if Russia were conquered by the French, the Jews would be granted emancipation. He was not in favor of emancipation. The Jews would be granted emancipation, and their connection with tradition would be weakened. With the advance of the French, uh, Schneer Zalman and his family fled from the uh, the Pale of, uh, of Settlement. Um, at some point in 1812, uh, he fell ill um, and he died and was buried in uh, in Haditz in the province of Poltava. After his death, just as a kind of uh, brief epilogue, as always, there a uh, dispute broke out uh, among uh, you know some of his. Uh, followers as to who would be the heir to his uh, to his legacy. Dov Bear, his eldest son and his principal disciple, won the day, and the Chabad Hasidic dynasty has uh, remained in the uh, in the family ever uh, ever since. Seven Lubavitcher uh, rebbe's until the death of the the seventh Lubavitcher rebbe, Menachem Mendel Schneerson. Um, that is the uh, that is the history of the rabbinic lineage beginning with the first Lubavitcher Rebbe, uh, Rabbi Schneir Zalman in, uh, in Liadi. Um, his, uh, one of his younger sons actually converted to, uh, uh, to Christianity. They think that he suffered from some kind of uh, mental, uh, uh, mental uh, instability. Okay, Rabbi Schneir Zalman uh, wrote a number of works. The two principal ones were the Tanya, 
which is studied on a daily basis by Chabad, uh, by Chabad Hasidim around, uh, around the world. That's not our topic for tonight. Um, and the Shulchan Ar Harav, which is going to be our topic for, uh, uh, for tonight. And we're going to come to, uh, to the Shulchan Aruch in, uh, in a minute. Uh, uh, Emmanuel Atkis sort of breaks down as a kind of summary breaks down the debates and the disputes of Rav Schneir Zalman's life into four conflicts. One was a battle he had to wage to reassure internally his own Hasidim that his way was uh, correct. And as I mentioned, you know, he held the Gaon responsible for the conflict and explained that the Vilna Gaon had really been misled. Number two, he had to wage this ongoing battle against the, uh, against the Misnagdim. He was a, a scholar of the first order, a massive, massive Talmud Chacham. And as we'll see soon, part of his agenda was to uh, promote uh, was to promote this idea that in fact he was not a sectarian, but that his arguments and his uh, positions were grounded deeply in the traditional halachic uh, process. Number three. He waged this battle against uh, uh, Russian uh, Russian authorities, and uh, in a certain way became a kind of Jewish icon because he was asked to speak not just on behalf of Hasidim but really on behalf of all Jews. And uh, and finally, there was this internecine dispute with Reb Abraham of uh, of Kalisk, which uh, you know is is a, a footnote for uh, for another uh, uh, for another time. Okay, let me pause here and just ask if there are any questions about. Uh, Rabbi Schneir Zalman's biography, and then I want to spend kind of the next uh, few minutes looking with you at um, really just a series of, of such fascinating uh, uh, material where we have his uh, um, uh, materials from the time that he was imprisoned in St. Petersburg in 1798. So questions or, uh, or comments? Rabbi Levine. Yes. Uh, two things. First, what do you call it? Are you going to discuss at all, or you think it's not relevant, Dr. Berger's criticism of the Lubavitcher movement? And the second thing is, are you going to discuss why the Lubavitcher Hasidim did not sell all the other Hasidim in the Hasidic movement, which was many and many uh, great rebbies of the Hasidic movement? What, what, tell me, um, about, the, about, about Lubavitch different than other Hasidic movements. So, I mean, your second question is why Lubavitch didn't? Correct. I mean, just fill in the blank. Why they didn't? Why were they accepted by Satmar and Boviv and, and, and Bian and Rizhen mm. and all the other Hasidic movements? They are, they are, they are not, they were never accepted. Okay. Okay. So um, two excellent, uh, two excellent questions. I, I, I can refer you to my teacher's book, uh, Dr. David Berger, Professor David Berger. I know um, he's your teacher. Uh, who wrote a book called uh, uh, The Rebbe, the Messiah and the Scandal of Orthodox uh, Indifference. Um, but tonight I really want to focus on the first Lubavitcher Rebbe as opposed to the, uh, as opposed to the seventh, although, although at the end, time uh, uh, permitting, I do want to circle back and think about the resonances between the first Lubavitcher Rebbe and his teachings that we're going to talk about in a minute and our contemporary moment and what Chabad means in 2022. Yeah, Garth or Esther? So for about this. stay out of this debate completely, like it wasn't their thing, and then... Is the Hasidic Nusach like in any way related to what would have been kind of like the average Sephardic Nusach of the day? So it's a great uh, it's a great question. Um, we may have a minute to uh, uh, to talk about it, but the short answer is that uh, the Hasidic Nusach is called colloquially Nusach Sfarad, um, even though it has very little to do with you know Edut Hamizrach and Sephardic. Uh, a Judaism or Sephardic practice, what separates or differentiates the Nusach of, uh, of, um, of the Hasidic Siddur, which is either Nusach Sfarad or Nusach Ari, um, is really the inclusion of uh, uh, mystical material. Um, and we'll talk about that in, uh, in a second. Yeah, Alan? Yeah, so the Nisnagdim in the Vilna Gon, their take on the Ari, and, and Kabbalah and that whole mysticism that you just were talking about, mm -hmm. I would imagine they were versed in this. 
yes, the Vilna Gon was um, uh, a Kabbalist. He knew uh, Kabbalah like uh, like the back of his hand. Um, it was, uh, uh, you know, and again, as we'll see, uh, we'll see in a second. Part of the objection was not to the study of of Kabbalah, but to the popularization of uh, of Kabbalah. Um, so, if you're a Kabbalist and you're initiated and you're trained, uh, by all means, right? Uh, this is holy material, and uh, you should uh, grow from it and uh, and learn it and uh, and digest it. But uh, the objections come not to the the content of the material itself, but rather to the way it's transmitted, how it's transmitted, um, to whom it's transmitted, and uh, and so on. Okay. So the material that I want to share with you now um, comes from the time that uh, Schneer Zaman of Liade uh, was in prison in St. Petersburg in, uh, in 1798. Um, and it's just, it's it's such extraordinary and fascinating material because we have the transcripts of the interview, right? The Russian authorities are asking the questions and Abshner Zalman is answering them. We have the transcripts, okay? And then, in addition, we have the, the document that Abshner Zalman writes as a, uh, as a response to the Russian authorities, right? They basically say, we have these 22... Uh, critiques or questions or uh, criticisms. How do you respond to them? And again, it's not the it's not the gulag. They're not the KGB. They're not torturing him. They they actually want to know, um, and they want to be able to go back to the uh, you know their higher ups and say we asked all the right questions and and we're satisfied with uh, with the answers, which is sort of which is sort of what happened. But the but the material that uh, that he writes is so telling. Because it it tells us everything that uh, uh, that was being asked or being questioned about this new about this new movement. So I want to just share with you a couple of excerpts. And again, there's so much here, and I'd be happy to uh, you know study it with you in depth at it uh, uh, you know another time. But just in the interest of uh, of time, I want to share with you just a couple of uh, just a couple of excerpts. Okay, so start with source number two. Um, which goes on and on on your uh, on your source sheets. So it's just an excerpt to give you a sense of the interrogation, the back and forth. So the she'ela, okay. So they asked him, "Ma mikorash el kazu mi maniga mi alchim acharav umimi avralo hashlita le." So they say, you know, tell us what what's the nature of this new sect? Kat is a very important word. Chaf tough. This new sect, this Hasidism. We haven't seen this before. The Jewish community was always the Jewish community with the capital T and traditional. So now we see there's something going on here and there's a rift and there's this new sect. So what is it? Who's the leadership? Who are the followers? And, and who's in charge? Chuva, and he says, oh, no, no, no. There is nothing new happening here. There's just some different explanations about our holy writings. You know, everyone follows their uh, their teacher with respect to how to understand halacha. Uh, he says, you know, this has been going on for hundreds of years. You know, rabbis give explanations for the for the holy uh, for the holy texts, and sometimes they reach different conclusions. So he says that's the only thing that's happening here. There's nothing. Uh, there's nothing new. Now, if you just continue, he makes a scathing allegation. He says, you know, There were always two houses of, of uh, worship in the Jewish community, a base Knesset and a base Medrash, what we call a shul and a base Medrash or a school. He says, you know, the shul is for people who have to run to work and they don't have a lot of, uh, they don't have a lot of time. They're very busy. They're not studying. And in the base medrash, you have people who are more learned and they have more time and they could daven, you know, with more kavan. Now, 
אז היו מהריכוס בתפילו, פלוס השחר, בכל יום ויום, ערך בי שעוס ויוסר מכך מס הריכוס כבנס שבלי, people used to take a long time, and they'd come an hour early, and they'd prepare themselves. אך אחר כך, he says, the problem is, עמדו אצלנו רבנים שאינם הגונים. We had over the past 200 years rabbis who became communal leaders who were totally unqualified and ill-equipped. And this is an amazing allegation. There's a lot of truth to it. He says, Vekanu esichro harabanus misarayir besach misuyam. They just bought the post. There's somebody in charge of the, you know, the, the, the region on a state level who was in charge of uh, rabbinic posts. And you give the guy a bribe and you become the rabbi. Bechol year v'yir, bechol malchus Poland. That's what happened. The whole Polish history. Ki ha'elim ha'alim ayin, the, you know, the government uh, turned a blind eye. Ba'asarim ba'ad, betz ha'kesef nasin b'chtav nikra kaznish la'araf she'bechol ir liyos moshe la'kol ha'yehudim she'bi'ira bechol inan anugel le'datam. He says they gave it away for a bribe. And he continues, he says, and these rabbis, they blew it. because they created uh, environments where davening was just racing through the tefillah and nobody paid any attention. And my main goal is just to restore things to the way they ought to be, where people actually think about and care about davening. So allegation number one, we're not going to cover all of them, but are you a sectarian? Is this all new? No, no, no. This is not new at all. Allegation number two, Um, you know, it, it seems that uh, it seems that you know they're doing something different about uh, about davening. Is that uh, is that true? He says, no, no, it's not. Uh, it's not true at all. We're just trying to return things to the way they were because uh, you know now that the Russians are in charge, things are much better. But when the Poles were in charge, what a disaster it was under the leadership of these unqualified uh, uh, on these uh, people who you know are unqualified to be uh, uh, to be rabbis okay. in the interest of time I'll just summarize uh, you know what he says in the uh, the next uh, paragraphs so they asked him you know um, we it seems to be um, that uh, that there's this uh, a Rebbe who gets uh, worshipped and he becomes this uh, leader and everyone follows him isn't you know, what's that about? And he says, no, 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 that's an old thing. There was always a Magid. There was always a preacher who inspired people with, uh, with their sermons and with their lectures and people gathered around. And he says, you know, a Rebbe is just, it's like a Magid. And it's slightly disingenuous because there's a principal difference between a Rebbe and a, and a Magid. But it, once again, you think this is all new? No, well, this is just a, an old, uh, this is just an old uh, a practice. The next uh, in paragraph, uh, Tezayin, if you're following in your source sheets, this circles back to what a couple of you have, uh, have asked. And, and he has to justify, he says, you know, you, you accuse us of publicizing Kabbalah. Okay? And, and that was a major accusation against the Balatanya because, right, this became, this became a Kabbalistic work for the layperson. And he says, no, I'm not telling them anything they don't already know. These Kabbalistic books have been in print for years and they're all accessible to the public. And I'm not doing anything here that's not been, that's not been done before. Finally, and again, just in the interest of time, there are many more, but one of the most scathing allegations, um, and this stuck with the Hasidim for hundreds of years, was the allegation that, they, that the Rebbe's were on the take. that people were coming in and making all sorts of gifts and the Rebbe's were taking these, uh, you know, kinds of indulgences. He says, no, we never charge for anything. We never asked anyone to, to bring anything. There were allegations that young people were stealing from their parents so they could bring gifts to the Rebbe and to the Hasidic court. He says, no, lo hayab lo nivra, never happened, was never a thing. If someone uh, comes and they have a wonderful experience, they want to make a donation to the, to the Hasidic court. So we're not stopping them. But he says, we never did anything. Uh, we never did anything untoward. We certainly never took any money that we weren't, uh, that we weren't uh, supposed, to, uh, supposed to take. So this is the background. I want to turn now to the Shulchan Ar-Harab. But it's against this, uh, uh, this backdrop that I want to introduce this, uh, uh, this book to you. The backdrop being that we have here in the person of Shneir Zalman of Liadi, the principal defender of Hasidus and the, the principal um, defender um, against 
all these accusations which are coming either directly from the Misnagdim or from the Misnagdim vis-a-vis the Russian government to whom they had informed on Rav Shner Zalman, right? Everything that uh, they could possibly find wrong with this new uh, with this new movement, right? They piled on, and Rav Shner Zalman has to answer uh, and to, has to answer these uh, these questions. So um, I'll just uh, uh, share with you the uh, the introduction. This is source number uh, source number three. Um, and again, in the interest of time, I'll, I'll mostly summarize it. Rabbi Shner Zalman never wrote an introduction to his Shulchan Ar Harav. Here's a, a copy of a 19th century uh, edition. Um, but uh, but his sons wrote an introduction to the uh, to the Shulchan Ar Harav, and they explain um, in the introduction that uh, at some point, when he was still a young man, uh, Rav Dov Bear of Mezrich, who you remember, was the Talmud of the the Baal Shem Tov. Rav Dov Bear of Mezrich got a hold of, uh, of Rav Shner Zalman of the Yadi, and he said, I, I, I need someone, I need someone to uh, present the, uh, uh, the Shulchan Arach in such a way that will be accessible and, uh, and, and meaningful to our people in this, uh, in this moment. He says, you know, people are uh, uh, people are suffering. People are very busy. People don't have the wherewithal to open up the the Shulchan Aruch and and learn it and and know it. So I need someone who's going to rework this uh, this book in a language in a tone that will be for our uh, for our moment. And he taps Reb Shner Zalman to do this. So and this is amazing, right? Reb Shner Zalman basically sets out to rewrite to rewrite the the Shulchan Aruch 200 years after it had been after it had been published and he writes a commentary not really a commentary but he rewrites the text to Orachayim and to Yeridea we mostly have Orachayim it's not on all of Orachayim we have most of his uh, text Orachayim a lot of Yeridea um, we no longer uh, we no longer have What's this text? What's the uh, what's the book? So, part of uh, part of what you would want to know about the Shulchan Aruch Harav is that it's exceptionally clear. The Shulchan Aruch Harav gives you all kinds of context and background that you wouldn't have if you were just reading uh, if you were just reading uh, a Shulchan Aruch. He constantly quotes the uh, the original sources going all the way back to uh, uh, Tanakh. I just did a quick uh, count. The word Shinamar appears in the Shulchan Aruch maybe 20 times in Arachayim, in, in the Shulchan Aruch Harav, in Rav Shner Zalman uh, Liadi's updated version, hundreds of times. He wants you to know where things, uh, uh, where things come from. Um, Rav Shlomo Zevin, who actually wrote uh, one of the only uh, academic articles about the Shulchan Aruch Harab has a theory, I'm not sure it always bears out, but his theory is that the Shulchan Aruch, Rabbi Yosef Kara was interested in practice. Here's a practical guide. You want to know the halacha? Open my book. I'll tell you what to do. And Rabbi Shner Zalman was interested in expanding Jewish knowledge. So not just to tell you what to do, but to tell you why you do it and how you do it and where it comes from and what it's about. And if we have time, I'll show you an example, um, an example uh, uh, or two. Um, he relies heavily on the Magen Avram, who we learned about uh, in, the last, uh, in the last session. And it's not coincidental that the Magen Avram relied heavily on the Zohar in his commentary. So the Shulchan Aruch Harav is also introducing a mystical element, a mystical component to an otherwise non-mystical uh, non book. So the question is, the question is, right, um, what is the nature? What is the nature of this uh, of this book? Okay. So let me just show you a couple um, a couple quick um, examples, so you get a sense of what it is that we're talking about, not just in an abstract way, but in a in a concrete way. And what I've done for you in the sources is I've paired um, a source from the Shulchan Aruch with the uh, kind of matching source from the uh, from the Shulchan Aruch Harav. So a quick example. And again, we've been learning Hilchos Hanukkah, but there is no Hilchos Hanukkah in the Shulchan Aruch Harav, so a couple excerpts from Hilchos Tefillah. The Shulchan Aruch writes, A person should always try to daven with a minion in shul. 
right? And if he's not able to get to shul, he should at least daven at the same time that the shul is davening. And again, just you could see it here. The Shulchan Aruch has one line. The Shulchan Aruch Harav has 20 lines. Now listen, and again, he's not plagiarizing. It's, it's all based on the Shulchan Aruch. He's giving you the same the same information, but listen to what he does with it. Word for word, the person should try to daven with the minion. Even if you could get a minion in your house, better to go to shul where there's more people. And you know something? Really, only the 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 tefillah of a base kinesis. That's the those are the words of tefillah that get heard. Why? Shanamar, he's again, he's not making this up. This is a Gemara. He says, I'll give you the Pasuk. Lishmoa el Harina vial hatfila. And it's actually right. Uh, we have a whole uh, uh, slicha about this on the first night of Slichos, Lishmoa el Arina vial hatfila. So the Pasuk says, Lishmoa el Arina vial hatfila. And the Gemara says, What's the taich? Bemakom rina sham tehetfila. Where you have the singing and you have the song and you have the tzibur, that's where the tefillah should be. So he transformed a, a pretty anodyne halacha into something with context and feeling. And like, now you know why. The Shulchan Aruch says, go to Shul, daven with the minion, be a good Jew. And the Shulchan Aruch Harab says, you should daven with the minion. You should be a good Jew. You should go to shul. That's where we sing. That's where there's a group of people. That's where your tefillah gets. Uh, that's where your tefillah gets uh, gets heard. Okay. Uh, two more uh, quick examples. Shochan writes in source number six. Yachol yispal b'chol lashon shiyirtze v'hani mili b'tzibur avol biyachol lo yispal b'ol b'lashon hakodesh. You could daven in any language that you want as long as you're with the minion. If you're by yourself, you should daven in Hebrew. Shochan Aruch Harav says, "Yachol yispal b'chol lashon shiurtz shkin spal b'tzibur." Avol biyachid lo yispal b'lashon hakodesh. When you daven by yourself, you have to daven in Hebrew. Why? Shochan Aruch didn't tell you. The Shochan Aruch says, "I'll tell you why." Lefi she'ein malacha yasharis makirin b'shari l'shonos, because the angels don't understand other languages. Ve'ayachid zarach lemalach melitz the kabel tefila so. Avol b'tzibur ein zarach lemelitz shnei marhein el kavir. Lo yimas, when you daven with the tzibur, your tefillah goes right to Hashem. But when you daven by yourself, there's an intercessor, there's a malach, there's an angel in between. And guess what? According to the Kabbalistic sources, the malachim don't understand other languages. They only know Hebrew, so you have to daven in Hebrew when you daven by yourself. So now you have the context and the background and the resources and the Kabbalah. I'll just summarize the next uh, the next source for you. This is actually going to be very uh, very important. Source number eight, the Shulchan Aruch says, you know, there's some debate as to whether or not you put on tefillin on chol moed, because on the one hand, uh, regular uh, chol on a weekday you put on tefillin, but on uh, on Shabbos and Yantif you don't put on tefillin, because the day itself is considered an os, so you don't need the os, you don't need the sign of the uh, of the tefillin. So Chol HaMoed, well, is it Shabbos? I mean, is it Yantif rather, or is it Chol? It's Chol HaMoed. It has this dual identity. So you could kind of hear both, uh, you kind of hear both sides. So the Shulchan Aruch writes, um, the Shulchan Aruch writes that, um, that what should you do? Um, according to the, uh, the Svardim, you don't put on, uh, you don't put on tefillin. And then, um, and then in uh, in Sif Beis v'chein noagim b'chol glilos elo laniach b'moed. This is the Rama, right? What we do in Ashkenazic lands is we put on tefillin on uh, on Cholamot. Okay, and this was kind of a divide between the Svardim and the uh, and the Ashkenazi. So what uh, what is the Shulchan Aruch Rav saying? So the Shulchan Aruch Rav, um, I'm sorry, I just quoted you from the Shulchan Aruch Rav. Who echoes the uh, who echoes the sentiment of the uh, of the Rama and says, right, Hasidim, you readers of my book, you should put on uh, you should put on uh, tefillin. If you ever meet if you ever met a Hasid or specifically a Chabad Hasid, you can be sure they are not putting on tefillin on Chalamoid. Okay, and you can go over to them and you could show them the Shulchan Aruch Harav and say, here it is, black on white, source number nine on Levine's source sheet. The Shulchan Aruch Harav wrote that you put on tefillin on Cholamoid. So what are you doing? 
And what will the Chassid answer you? Or what will the Chabadnik answer you? We'll say that's just what it says in the Shulchan Aruch Haram. But you have to know the sitter. Everyone knows that the author of the Shulchan Aruch Haram also wrote a commentary to the sitter. And whenever there's a debate between the sitter and the Shulchan Aruch Haram, we always follow the sitter. And in the sitter, he tells you not to put on tefillin. In source number 11, you can see the introduction to the sitter, Avram Chaim Na'e. Uh, writes about uh, all these discrepancies between the Shulchan Aruch HaRav and, uh, and the Siddur, and concludes by telling us, no, 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 in the end, in the end, you always follow, you always follow the, uh, uh, the Siddur. Okay. So um, I, I bring this, uh, I bring this out um, to, uh, to make the following, uh, to make the following point. Why did the uh, why did Rav Shner Zalman of Liadi write the Shulchan Aruch Haraf? He wrote it because Rudov Ber Mezrich asked him to write it. But he wrote it so that his opponents would know or would believe that the followers of Hasidism were traditional Jews. So you think we're deviant and we're sectarian and we do things differently. Read my book. You'll see that we're totally traditional including in areas where you think that well, you see we don't put on tefillin. No, 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 right. We do exactly what you do. Here it is. And then kind of, you know, on the side, you know, uh, the Torah Shabal Peh and the Siddur, if you really want to know, right, what you tell the Hasidim is, we don't do that. We, that we, Hasidim have a, different, uh, have a different take. We don't put on tefillin on, uh, on Chalamari. The Shulchan Acharav was an attempt to show the traditional world that Hasidism should be taken seriously in the world of Talmud Torah. Rav Shner Zalman was the best person to do that because he was a massive Talmud Chacham and he knew all the sources backwards and forwards. And he wrote a traditional book rather than justify any questionable practices. He didn't say, oh, you know, we don't put on tefillin. I'll explain to you. He could have done that and he would have had plenty of sources to, to do it because he knew them all. He didn't do that. The book preached traditional, traditional Judaism. I'll conclude with um, uh, two final, uh, two final points. One is an excerpt from the summary of Emmanuel Etkis, who writes so beautifully, even though it's in translation. He says, "Rabbi Zalman's rise to leadership happened by chance. Not only did he not attain that position by virtue of his ancestry, but he did not even desire it." Even after he was called on to fill the void that was created in the leadership of the Hasidim of, the Hasidim of White Russia after Reb Nachem Mendel of Vitebsk and Reb Abraham of Kalis went to live in the lands of Israel, he was reluctant and refused. Only after these leaders kept insisting did he overcome his hesitations and accede to their request. Within a few years, Shner Zalman had proved that he stood head and shoulders above the other Hasidic leaders of his time. Indeed, he possessed a combination of virtues. He was a rabbinic scholar a deep and original thinker, and a talented preacher, educator, and administrator. In addition, he had a deep sense of mission, firm confidence in the rightness of Hasidism, and great sensitivity to the needs of the Jews in the Russian Empire. Moreover, he possessed courage, authority, determination, and self-control. Hence, it is no wonder that Schneer Zalman can be seen as a charismatic leader in the full sense of of the word. Like other Hasidic courts, Shner Zalman's also served as a center for conversion to Hasidism. However, in this matter, Shner Zalman acted in his own unique fashion. The institution of Yechidus, personal interviews, took on the character of an intimate and deep encounter of the Rebbe with the Hasid in an effort to offer him the spiritual direction that suited his personality and needs. The public sermon became an exhilarating experience, in part because it was grasped as an event in which the secrets of the Torah were revealed. The sermons were written down, copied by the Hasidim, and studied. The Tanya became a guide in the service of God, and those who visited the court were invited to take part in lessons on the Tanya and the words of Hasidism. The increase in the numbers of Hasidim drawn to Shneer Zalman's court during the 1790s confronted him with a difficult dilemma. Should he devote most of his time and energy to fostering the connection with his veteran Hasidim, or was it preferable to attract new Hasidim? Shneer Zalman chose the latter alternative. I'll conclude with one, uh, with, one final, uh, with one final thought. Okay. Rav Shner Zalman of Liadi was an extraordinary man who wielded enormous influence both in his lifetime and after his lifetime. Today, there's certainly not the same emphasis on erudition or scholarship in Chabad like there once was, even though there is this tradition to study, uh, to study the Tanya. 
but it struck me that at least three of the major aspects of Rav Schneir Zalman's life continue to animate the movement. And again, I'm not a scholar of Chabad, but number one, there's a continued emphasis on proselytizing, right? There's missionaries who are sent all over the world to bring people in under the umbrella of Chabad Hasidism. There's a continued sense of this us-them mentality that separates adherence from would-be adherence, right? We're, we are, we are different. And finally, there's an abiding desire to gloss over those differences between traditional Judaism and Chabad Hasidism, a desire to be seen and treated as normative. Look at my Shulchan Aruch Harav. I'm not doing anything different. This is totally normative. Everything is just the way it should be. Since the 16th century, some of the greatest rabbinic minds hitched their wagons to Rabbi Yosef Karo and wrote commentaries to the Shulchan Aruch, but there's only one person that I know of, only one person who quite literally rewrote the book. Okay. The Vilna Gon and his followers considered Hasidim to be sectarians. It was the sectarians who considered themselves to be traditional. I'm going to pause here. And, uh, um, and and stay on. I'm happy to take uh, questions or uh, or comments, but I'm just going to stop the video so it doesn't uh, it doesn't go on and on.